From the moment the nether was announced, the aether was inevitable. Immediately after the announcement of a brand new dimension coming to Minecraft, forums lit up with ideas of what other new dimensions could possibly be added in the future. While thousands of ideas were thrown around, some more robust and popular than others, there was one that felt far more natural than the rest. If there's a hell, why not a heaven? The Aether began development in earnest in 2011, not as an official update, but rather a mod. The Nether had been out since Halloween of the previous year, and its DNA had already been baked into Minecraft's culture. The dimension, despite the fire and hellstone and hostile wildlife, was incredibly barren. Nether fortresses wouldn't exist until later that year, leaving the most notable thing about the Nether to be… its roof. One of Minecraft's biggest draws, even back then, was the idea of infinity. Having a world that would always expand for your sake drew people in, giving endless room for exploration and resources and building and living space, but it was only infinite in five directions. In survival, you had no way to break through the bedrock at the bottom of the world, and while there was a build limit, the sky was still there. If you had some way to launch yourself, you could, indeed, be sent far above that invisible limit, having nothing but the sky surrounding you in every direction, the ground now being too far away to render, if only for a moment. The Nether, wanting to feel oppressive, removes that sky. You are underground, under something, and all you can do now is move outwards. It was a place meant to be uninhabitable, dangerous but useful to travel through, its blocks being the length of eight blocks in the overworld. The Nether was, by design, for transit, not somewhere meant to be lived. With this addition, and the possibilities for new dimensions opening, the game was yearning to be truly infinite. And yet, before the game could produce its own new dimension, its players gave their own idea a try. Floating worlds have been a staple of video games since the dawn of 3D technology, a representation of freedom and adventure. However, its birth represented quite the opposite. It's been said by many at this point that Doom and other titles like it are not actually 3D, and while in reality that's arguable, it was without a doubt one of the first games to truly appear to be 3D. However, Doom and most games like it existed almost entirely in cramped interiors. Literally called corridor shooters, the decision to stick mostly to rooms and hallways was not a fully willing one. Doom's engine, while a technical and creative marvel, had many, many limitations. While some are well known, like not being able to have one floor above another, an even more troubling one had to do with rendering. Doom had no fancy tricks to cut down on things like render distance or optimization, meaning that if too much of a level was visible at any given time, your game would crash instantly. Outside sections were forced to be incredibly simple, essentially being single large boxes with entirely flat ground, with the only complex level structure possible being put into places where your vision was limited by closed off rooms and claustrophobic walls. Once games became non-arguably 3D, however, the troubles with large landscapes continued. While Super Mario 64 was far from the first 3D game, it was set to define and popularize a lot of the ideas and principles for designing them in the future. It was the first game to have a fully dynamic 3D camera, and it allowed anyone to explore every single part of the map from any angle they wanted to. At the time the game was released, 3D graphics cards were still painfully limited though, and so one of the biggest challenges was to get the game running without being a painfully laggy mess. In contrast to 2D games, where all landscape decoration simply exists as the game's backdrop, and is often just a still image scrolled along with the player, all terrain in 3D games not only has to be viewable from all angles, but it has to be rendered. Unlike modern games where you can use things like level of detail to make faraway land less resource intensive, old 3D games kinda just looked that way everywhere, to the point where there was nothing to reduce. And so, faced with this problem, and not wanting every level to be indoors, Super Mario 64 just… didn't have out of bounds terrain. Levels would either be surrounded by hills and invisible walls you couldn't cross, or the level would simply be floating in the air. Rendering a continuous world was also too intensive, and so they baked that limit into the level design too, having us teleport into tiny worlds via paintings. And so, not only were these lands literally isolated, they artistically were as well. These worlds were framed in the same way their paintings were, we simply couldn't see past the part where the artist stopped painting. What's interesting to me is that despite these worlds largely being floating islands, due to the way they were designed, they never really feel that way. One of the few places you can fall out of the world on the non-edges of a level is in the ice slide area of Cool Cool Mountain. And yet, the way this room is designed implies the existence of a cave, one that actually does have a floor, one potentially even close by and connected to the walls, just one we can't really see. 
The normally bright sky around us is instead replaced with pitch black darkness, the sun having no presence here. While there is no floor functionally, there is a completely connected interior aesthetically. The cave doesn't just end where the game stops showing it, after all. This seems to be the case for almost every area where you can fall out of the game world besides the world painting's edges. These areas are almost always interior, surrounded on all sides except for the one below you. There is implied to be, at some point soon, a connected floor. This is even the case for the Bowser levels, one of the few that is both open and has a black void below it. If you look out to the poorly textured skybox, you see, replacing the actual sky, stalagmites. We are underground, underneath something. However, this interior rule has some exceptions. After collecting 10 power stars, suddenly, the sun mural on the ground of the castle's lobby has a beam of light cast on it. And, in a game spent looking down towards hazards, if you look up towards the light, you're suddenly in a place far above the land, one cast fully in the light of the sun. While these structures are connected to the ground somewhere, falling is the only hazard in this level. And it's no coincidence that the first level that truly breaks this aesthetic rule is the very first one where you learn how to fly. This level, outside of being incredibly frustrating, feels beautifully freeing. In contrast to the deep, dark pits enhancing the fear of falling down, you focus entirely on going up. The song used in this level is a rendition of the Invincibility Star theme, giving a sense of untouchability. There are literally fucking rainbows, I mean, come on. This area is such a stark contrast to the falling hazards in every other part of the game, giving the all-encompassing feeling of ascent, of light, of beauty, of, well, heaven. Light beams from the entrances of every single one of these levels, a promise that what you're about to enter will be far different from the paintings and caves you've seen before. A promise that what you're about to play is beyond a painting. It's an entire world surrounding you, a level floating in an endless sky. Technology around 3D rendering, ever since its inception, was quickly progressing, and even just a few years down the line, far more land could be rendered with far more complexity. Just two years later, Nintendo's own Ocarina of Time far outclassed Super Mario 64's capabilities. Not only were the graphics significantly more complex, but the environments were massive, showcasing vast, albeit somewhat simplistic landscapes to truly bring the life of the Zelda series to a brand new format. Not even two years after that, the game Jet Set Radio was able to depict entire cityscapes, not just with a clean and stylish look, but with multiple NPCs working and moving at any given time. It didn't just depict a city, but gave it the life it needs to truly feel real. Every single year, we would get games bigger and better and more lifelike than the last, immersing us in worlds that closer and closer resembled our own reality, even with their more fantastical elements. However, while by all means the strict limitations that made floating islands a necessity were all gone, the idea of them never seemed to disappear. At the turn of the century, a JRPG game came to the Dreamcast called Skies of Arcadia. Up until this point, the idea of floating islands was always both mechanical and aesthetic, being forced to exist as a compromise and then being canonized in the world as a result. You need to be able to fall on platformers, here's an endless void to fall in. For Skies of Arcadia though, there is absolutely no platforming. The game's producer, Rieko Kodama, actually had the opposite progression when it came to the concept for the game. It originally was planned to center around trains and remain entirely on the ground, even further on rails. Once Arcadia was set to be on the Dreamcast instead of the Sega Saturn though, granting it much more processing power, she opted for a brand new direction to the game. That direction, of course, being upwards. Likely inspired in part by works like Howl's Moving Castle, you play as a band of sky pirates on a floating ship traveling between six different floating continents. The lands were widely shattered thousands of years ago by super weapons called Gaigas, massive creatures that are trying to be reawakened by Empress Theodora, who aims to take over the world. Your group of pirates are part of the Blue Rogues, a Robin Hood-like group looking to destroy the Empire entirely. Classic JRPG stuff. At this point in the RPG genre, games were both dark thematically and literally, with desperate, depressing, apocalyptic scenarios being the norm. While Skies of Arcadia has similarly high stakes, the tone of the game was designed to be the clear opposite. While the setting changed during development, the goal from the start was to make a game that was light-hearted and optimistic, and, in the search through the video game landscape for something to truly represent that freedom, there is nothing more natural than flying through the sky. When Wii Sports Resort was released, it had a wide selection of games and sports to choose from, and I do mean a wide selection. 
In comparison to the first Wii Sports, it had two and a half times the categories of games, each with smaller games within them and much more complexity than before, for better or for worse. And yet, among all of these, there was one that seemed to capture the hearts of some more than anything, the minigame Island Flyover. To call this a game is honestly stretching it. It serves more as a means of exploration, a look around Woohoo Island, the setting for all the various sports in the game. You fly around in a biplane collecting eye tokens, giving you short descriptions about each and every notable location. And that's it. Yet as a kid, I'd find myself coming back to this experience over and over again, seeing Woohoo Island in new ways every time, hunting for those final few tokens. The time of day would change after each fly-through, showing the island population turning on their lights or gathering at the beach. Small details gave life to this island that in any other video game would just serve as a means to an end. This mode was so popular that they made a spin-off exclusively around it, Pilot Wings Resort, a combination of two different game series centered entirely around exploring Woohoo Island in all new forms of flight. While not in the lofty setting of Skies of Arcadia, the bright colors and freedom these games gave us felt mesmerizing. Just like our ancestors, the desire to break the chains of gravity lives on through us. Among the wide gaming sphere, though, these floating worlds were an exception and not the rule. 3D games were, for the most part, not focused on flight nor fantasy, but rather on expansion. Studios wanted to see how big and realistic of a world, both technologically and thematically, they could create. By the mid-2000s, with the 3D arms race in full force, games were already getting somewhat close to looking realistic. Compared to releases just five years ago, games like Resident Evil 4 and Splinter Cell were leaps and bounds closer to our world. And, fitting to that dedication to realism, the tone of these games looked to match it. That's to say, there was a lot of brown. Colors, the most immediate and explosive way to give life to games, were muted to fit the more grounded stories. They were grey in every sense of the word, even in works of complete fiction. Resident Evil 4, while fantastical and almost cartoonish in its concept, a government agent saving the president's daughter from a cult in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, it's played as if the world before the apocalypse was hardly different than ours. God of War is a video game about gods killing each other, and yet the most daring color on screen for the majority of the game is a glowing orange from the occasional bit of lava. He ascends to fucking Mount Olympus and becomes the new god of war, and the room he sits in at the end of everything is dingy with a tiny piece of light surrounding his throne, and everything else looking like a broom closet with the light turned off. Even in their wildest fantasies, these games were focused on realism, and bloom, like a lot of bloom, like a blinding amount of bloom. They expanded in scale, got bigger and better, and yet somehow found a way to make it feel depressingly real. And for years to come, this arms race would only get fiercer. Set pieces got larger, map sizes doubled and tripled, fidelity only got closer and closer to our own world. However, as a side effect of this emerging technology, the games that weren't cutting edge had the chance to do things these AAA games could never imagine. Minecraft at its infancy was made by one man, and yet its tagline and immediate draw was in part the idea of an infinite world. By simplifying the game's design, from millions of polygons to a bunch of simple cubes, all the processing power and techniques and advancements of the past 15 years could be put entirely into expansion itself. Using a seed, the game was able to generate brand new land automatically and continuously. In contrast to the small, detailed paintings presented to us in the world of Super Mario 64, we now have the world these paintings are stored in. As time has gone on though, and as these games have closer resembled the real world, in textures, in size, in tone, in physics, and in style, the magic of games have become less and less emphasized. We are held down by the gravity of Earth, and have dedicated billions of dollars into giving these worlds that very same gravity. Once Minecraft announced something new though, a brand new dimension, something changed. While the dimension being added was something even deeper down below, the idea of new dimensions brought Minecraft's community the ability to dream up any sort of world they would want for the game. And so, not long after the Nether was released, so too was the Aether. This mod is perhaps the most famous Minecraft mod in existence, at least compared to the content it provided. To be honest, while what it did was definitely unique, it was nothing like a brand new game of content to explore. It was advertised as a new dimension, and a new dimension it was. 
Forming glowstone in the same formation as you would another portal and activating it with water, you are brought to a brand new kind of world. Notably, the original Skyblock was first made in the September of 2011, making this mod one of the first ever times where the ground was simply not there. Not only were you suspended above the world, there was no actual world below you. You existed entirely in a land of floating islands, surrounded by an infinite sky. The dimension, in slight contrast to Minecraft, focused much more on adventure. While this wasn't heaven in the traditional sense, there were monsters after all, it gave itself to all the floatiness and optimism of the aesthetic. The color scheme consisted of notably cool colors, in contrast to the harsh warm tones of its opposite. Daylight not only meets you when you enter, but stays permanently, all the way up until the end of the mod. Due to the gaps between islands, flight became a necessary mechanic to the world, and forms of it were put into nearly every living creature you could find. Sheep were able to slow their flight, pigs and cows were given large, illustrious wings. Tempest clouds challenged you with gravity itself, their projectiles simply pushing you rather than doing physical damage, a constant reminder that this is a place where an errant push could, in fact, kill you. Even further, unlike games before, your character didn't fall into some black area and die. No, if you fall in the Aether, you find yourself falling back into the overworld itself. The main content of the dimension was found in its three dungeons, each scaling and challenge and reward for completing them. They existed as structures naturally housed in the world itself, with a boss waiting at the end of each of their cores. After beating each boss, all with different mechanics, you're given a key, one that gives you some of the better loot you could possibly find in the mod. However, unlike nearly every Minecraft mod to exist, even the best tools available were somewhat understated in their strength. The Gravitite Sword did no more damage than a regular diamond one. In fact, even the best drops from dungeon chests, specialized swords, still do no more damage, and all their extra effects are balanced out by their horrible durability, one-fifth that of diamond tools. All new items and mechanics were designed with the entire game in mind, with gliders and effects and weapons all having usage outside of the dimension itself, while not being so powerful as to ruin the rest of the game. Truly, the designers of the Aether did not set out to make a mod. They tried, and succeeded, to make a brand new update to the game, one cast in the clouds and with all the freedom and danger it gives you. But Mojang didn't add the Aether. No they made something else. As of today, only two new dimensions have ever been added to Minecraft. The Nether, and the End. To understand the End, we need to understand how we get there. The only items you actually need to get to the dimension are Eyes of Ender, which require you to enter the Nether. This progression is honestly pretty basic, at its most efficient you only need a few steps to reach the final area and boss of the game, but the requirement to go down below, down to the nether, is mandatory. Once you're back in the overworld, you use your extra eyes of ender to navigate to the nearest stronghold, forcing you to eventually dig down, deep into the ground to find it. Throughout this entire process, and in fact the entire game, there's evidence that you're far from the first person to do this. These ruins, these portals, these strongholds were built by things before you, ones with a need for prison cells and libraries, and a need for a stronghold itself, either to protect themselves from things, or to protect things from whatever's inside. By the time you arrive though, it has long rotted. For the Aether, the portal was modeled after that of the Nether, for the important use of back and forth travel. While you do go up and down in both dimensions, you mainly go north, south, east, and west, and so the portal acts much like a doorway. In contrast, the end portal is a hole. A hole pointing straight down below. Below the stone. Below the nether. Down below everything. Into a place we cannot see in the overworld. One only shown to us through outside means. A portal leading straight into the void. The end is a fascinating place. At its creation, this island was it. There was absolutely nothing in all directions around you. Unlike the Aether, if you fly up high enough, you won't find yourself at the bottom of some new dimension. Every other dimension in the game has some type of floor, an implication that there is more bedrock beneath the surface. Lore-wise, the void does not exist in the other two dimensions, not in the overworld and not in the nether. It's a compromise of the infinite generation, it's necessity to load chunks all at once. In the story of Minecraft, these worlds, the overworld and the nether, seem somehow connected. There is bedrock above and below the nether, some type of continuity to it, something akin to Terraria. 
And yet, standing against these entirely is the end. It didn't need to be infinite in the same way the other dimensions are, and yet it feels, more than anything, like this one is infinite only because the others are. Like some floor beneath it, a part attached to the rest and yet still completely separate. While the construction of games and their environmental storytelling is normally at odds, needing to compromise to give the illusion of a real place, Minecraft has no definite story. It speaks to us through video game conventions, and as such, its final area, the end of everything, isn't hell, but something else. The part of levels where the game ends and you start anew, the pit you're never allowed to see the bottom of. We're peering inside the world that only our characters get to see, an endless, vacuous, black pit. While Heaven and Hell to us is the Aether and the Nether, to video games, it's the overworld and the end. The world you can never fall out of, and the one where you already have. These four extremes, the odds and ends of aesthetics and functionality, feel all connected in strange ways. And so, the Aether's absence in the main game of Minecraft has always felt odd. Ultimately, we don't know why no new dimensions have been added. Perhaps it was somehow planned at some point, only to be cancelled. But regardless of if it ever happens, the Aether has cemented itself into Minecraft culture, in the same way the Nether did. Hoaxes on activating the Aether portal have existed forever. The mod was even recently remastered for the newest updates. A ripoff version of it was turned into a purchasable mod in Minecraft Bedrock. This simple mod, abandoned by both time and progress, never seemed to really leave. And honestly, how could it? It's our desire for flight, for a release from gravity, the wish to float, to be free of the ground, for adventure, for color, for the bright, all-encompassing sky. Hazard or difficulty aside, the stakes being just as high as anywhere else in the game, the pure joy of the Aether alone was enough to keep it with us. The moment the Nether was announced, the possibility for new worlds to be explored, the Aether was inevitable. It might have taken longer or had been under a different name, but its essence exists in all of us. And so, in a game where we could create anything, we must create this. A world unbound from gravity. One where we can truly feel free. Thank you, and have a nice day. Okay, I can't be fucked to put my microphone on the mount right now, so we're just gonna- I'm just holding it in my hand. I have a $500 microphone, I'm just holding it in my hand. Uh, Patreon. I make videos. Patreon, uh, give- gives me money. You can give me money for Patreon, and I'll have the money, and then I'll, uh, not go, uh, broke. Uh, there's benefits, I don't fucking care to list them, but the main one is that I shout you out at the end of videos, so I'm gonna do that now. Alright, thank you to Jericho, Jolts, Wells, DeMorenville, about 43 rats in a trench coat that go by the twat's name Tommy, Jesus Christ, Arkan Atlan, Brody Larson, Dankly Voidly, Edmund Dong, SC, Great Value Gaming, Grinkle Stinkle, Lavender, MF Bitch Boy, Tactical Cheese, Willem, Zimborg, A Magic Muffin, Bestest Patron, Big Dave, Brian Jackson, Brian Jackson, there, there's two of them, Chris Gunther Zack, David Kleinens, Glugglejug, Jug, Maiden Batter, No Joke, Ilt Flakes from Outer Space, Ribbonaster, Ro Ramden, Hi Ro, love your stuff. Ryan NG, Sess, Shaneful, Ted H, Terrifying Spoon, and Undersea Rexy VT, and then like all the rest of them. They're, they're, I, I don't. I, I'm only obligated to shout out the the ones five and above. Okay, you can't you can't tell me what to do. Anyways, um, thanks. Bye. <laughs>